Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Center for American Progress Action Fund. My name is Winnie Stackelberg, and I'm the Executive Vice President for External, here, External Affairs here at the Action Fund. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this incredibly timely discussion about the economic instability that has become a mainstream experience for low- and mid middle-income households and the progressive steps we can take to lift up more American families. Today, economic inequality in America has reached historic heights. With stagnant wages and limited benefits, working families have struggled simply to put food on the table and gas in the tank. And in recent months, even conservatives have talked about finally addressing our poverty crisis. They've held forums and given speeches. They've punched up their slogans and polished their talking points. Unfortunately, the one thing they haven't changed is their policies. We've heard this fairy tale before. Cut taxes for the wealthiest, cut benefits for the poor poorest, and somehow, just somehow, in a world without math or logic, the problem of inequality will disappear. American families simply cannot afford to relive the failed policies that got us here in the first place. And they certainly cannot afford Speaker Ryan's newest plan, which, just like every plan he's previously proposed, will cripple our economy and plunge millions into poverty. It's time for someone to tell conservative leaders in Congress that they don't get points for consistency when they are consistently wrong. <laughs> or at least, at the very least, buy themselves a functioning calculator. But while conservatives have been putting better lipstick on the same old pig, progressives have actually focused on solutions. We've made critical progress under the Obama administration, from expanding access to affordable health care to the recent vi uh, victories in overtime pay and strengthening tax credits for working families. But there's still much more work to do, and the numbers are truly startling. Economic insecurity is the new normal, as stable jobs and decent wages have become a luxury. Today, one in three Americans, more than 105 million people, live in poverty or are teetering on the economic brink with incomes of less than twice the poverty line. If not for the dramatic rise in widespread economic insecurity since 2000, nearly 13 million fewer Americans would be living in or on the brink of poverty. But ele elevated poverty levels and stagnant incomes are not inevitable. They're the result of deliberate policy choices that put income into the hands of the most affluent Americans, but leave millions more with barely enough to get by. We have the power to change course and build an economy that works for everyone, not just the wealthy few. And yesterday, our sister organization and institution, the Center for American Progress, released a blueprint for a policy framework that would dramatically reduce poverty and restore the American dream along five core areas, building better jobs and wages, valuing all families, ensuring basic living standards, investing in human capital, and fifth, removing barriers to opportunity. This blueprint, authored by CAP's Melissa Boteach, Rebecca Vallis, and Eliza Schultz, features several ideas that Senator Brown will touch upon today, such as strengthening tax credits for working families to help them make ends meet and cover expenses that can't wait until tax time. Now, more than ever, we need policies that address the challenges low-income families face every day and give more Americans a fair shot at success. And we need leaders like our next speaker who are ready to fight for working families at every turn. Over his four decades of public service, Senator Sherrod Brown has been a champion for working families and a national leader on our country's most critical issues, from financial regulation and retirement security to affordable health care 
and LGBT rights. And when it comes to the economic security of American families, there is no bigger champion than Senator Sherrod Brown. Last year alone, he helped lead the successful fight to make permanent key provisions of tax credits for working families that prevented 16 million people from falling into or deeper into poverty. When it comes to progress, the Center for American Progress Fund has a steadfast partner in Sherrod Brown, and today he's continuing to lead the way, previewing new legislation to reduce poverty, expand opportunity, and make the tax code work better for working families. Please join me in welcoming Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown. Winnie, thank you. It's always great to be at Center for American Progress. Thank you for the work you do here. Uh, Melissa, thank you. And Jessica, thanks for the words that you are about to share with us, too. It's, um, it's great to be back. Thank you for your activism and idealism of darn near everybody in this crowd. And I know the work you do. Uh, I remember the early days of, of uh, Center for American Progress when uh, the, the, we had someone in the White House that we'd not consider an ally and how you really helped all of us fight back and get to a very different place for our country. So um, thank you all for that so much. Um, about um, four decades ago, as a very young man, I made my first trip to Israel. And um, as a Lutheran kid growing up in Mansfield, Ohio, I, I always wanted to go to, to that place. And I, I was um, taken, first of all, by reading the Old Testament and the New Testament about the, the language, the, 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 the thought of how they made the desert bloom. About 25 years ago, a decade and a half later, I went back to Israel with two Jewish friends from Cleveland. And um, they knew enough about me and my faith and my views about justice that um, they, we journeyed to uh, the top of a hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee, uh, where it was believed that Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we were talking, these two Jewish friends, with a Canadian Israeli guide. Um, the four of us were standing there, and, and one of them turned to me with a Bible, a New Testament, with the um, open to Matthew 5. And they said, please read this to us. Um, and it was, um, it was Matthew 5.13. It was the Beatitudes. And I, I, I've always thought that, and they, I think they kind of knew that. I've always thought that that was the greatest sermon ever delivered and the greatest political speech um, ever given. And it, it, it informs the work that I've done in my political career. I hope it also informs the way I live my life. I, maybe uh, you never know that. But I also, it informed, I remember in my 2006 announcement speech, which I, when I announced for the Senate that year to run against a Republican incumbent, uh, after a decade or so in the House, I, um, I mentioned the Beatitudes in my, my announcement speech, how important it is that, that we, always, um, we always strive for economic justice. It's why I came to the Senate, and last year um, we got something really big done. Uh, as as Winnie said, um, that that uh, I think fits what what the Beatitudes were all about. I I would add that um, the department she mentioned the Department of Labor's overtime rule, which was another huge victory, showing the importance of a Democratic president with a Democratic Department of Labor with an aggressive anti-poverty, pro-jobs, pro-growth pro-wage agenda, and that is so very, very important. But let me tell you, the purpose of the speech really today is to, I think, set a model. I mean, you can, this is one story. We can tell certainly the story of the DOL rule and how important that was, and there was engagement on a lot of us in the Senate and engagement of outside groups and engagement of CAP to make these things happen. But let me take on a more nor narrow, in a more narrow way how we got from, from having no chance with the earned income tax credit to make it permanent to success, and it's I think it's a model that the cap help, at which cap help us arrive. It's a model that a lot of you in this room are engaged in. Uh, Gideon in my office was sort of the mastermind of it in in making it happen in the Senate. And let me just tell you about it. And you you know the issues. Productivity has gone up over the past four decades. Profit corporate profits have gone up, yet wages have barely budged. And the middle class has shrunk literally in every single state in the country. And the middle class shrinks. It's not they're growing 
not very many in the middle class are getting richer. It's obviously the middle class shrinking means people are dropping out the bottom. When workers, wage stag when workers wages stagnate, they struggle to provide for their families. We have a moral problem. When people who work hard and take responsibility in their, for their families and their lives, when they believe the system is rigged, the economy is rigged, we have a political problem. When the next generation of workers has fewer prospects for upward mobility, we have an economic problem. That's why programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit, which we insist travel together through the legislative process and in this discussion, why they are so important. These are credits that reward work. They lift millions of Americans out of poverty. More than 27 million American households claim the EITC received an average of $2,400, real money for real families in real neighborhoods. These dollars don't get put in a Swiss bank account. These dollars are spent in that community by workers meeting their daily needs and spent to help businesses generate economic growth in our communities. EITC was signed into law in 1975. It was created to make sure we have a tax system that provides incentives to work, especially for low and middle income people. That's what it's done. EITC has lifted more children above the poverty line than any other government program. The EITC expansions of the 1990s helped more than half a million single mothers move from cash welfare assistance to work, double the results of the more controversial, for a reason, welfare reform. Our work last year to permanently expand EITC and CTC is a model for how we advance progressive policies for in today's Congress. Think about it. Conservative majorities in both houses of Congress, we passed one of the biggest victories for working Americans in the past decade. Some group, thank you. So, uh, an anti-poverty group said next to the, next to the um, Affordable Care Act, the, permanent, the permanence of EITC, C, EITC, CTC was the greatest, the greatest victory in fighting poverty of anything Congress has done in a quarter century. Didn't happen by accident. As we look at our list of priorities for working families, it's worth remembering how we got where we are. Congress expanded EITC and CTC as part of the, the Recovery Act, the stimulus package passed, pushed by the Obama administration. We increased the size of EITC for families with more than two children. We reduced the marriage penalty. We reduced the income threshold for the refundable child tax credit. We temporarily extended those expansions again in 2010 as part of a short-term extension of the Bush tax cut and then again in 2012 as part of the legislation that allowed a portion of the Bush tax cuts to expire. The second extension in 2012 was a mistake. We allowed a permanent extension of a reduced estate tax for some of the wealthiest Americans in exchange for only a five-year extension of tax credits for working families. Think about this. 2001, Bush tax cut. 2003, Bush tax cuts. 2004, repatriation, bringing money back home for little benefit, except for the stockholders of, in those companies. 2010, Bush tax cuts. 2012, fiscal cliff deal. What they had in common, they were great for corporate America. What they also had in common, they did little for low-income people. It's a mistake working families can't afford to see us do again. 2013, I joined the Senate Finance Committee. My first tax bill as a member of the committee was the Working Families Tax Relief Act. It's why I wanted to be on, I wanted to be on this committee for a whole lot of reasons. Trade issues, Medicaid expansion, uh, low income tax credits, the list goes on. But my first bill, as I said, was the Working Families Tax Relief Act, which would make EITC and CTC expansions permanent. It would index CTC to inflation. It would expand the EITC to more workers. The first step getting it passed was to get the Democratic caucus in, engaged in making it a top priority. It wasn't evident or obvious that that could happen. People like the poverty team at CAP and the grassroots activists played a critical role in this effort. Strategy worked. More than two-thirds of Senate Democrats signed on as co-sponsors. Next, we needed to figure out how to get Republicans to yes. House Republicans had passed a series of standalone tax provisions benefiting, shockingly, corporate, corporate America. Things like the R&D, some of them I agree with actually, but things like the R&D tax credit provisions to benefit multinational companies, those would be permanent. And that was our opening. In the fall of 2014, I publicly prom uh, proposed a compromise on tax extenders. We would make some business tax provisions permanent, but only, only under the condition that EITC and CTC permit were permanent. We laid down a marker, no tax breaks for, out co for corporations without tax breaks for working families. 
Uh, you know how good conservatives are at, at, at naming things, the death tax, things like that. Well, our little mantra was no tax breaks for corporations without tax breaks for working families. No tax breaks for corporations. I said it a hundred times. I knew we were approaching victory when I saw senior Democrats in the Democratic caucus stand up one day in about July saying, you know, we can't do tax breaks for corporations without tax breaks for working families. And I screamed hallelujah. Um, <laughs> When some in Congress tried to strike a deal that didn't include EITC and CTC, we refused to bend, and the bill failed. So when we laid down the same marker in 2015, House Republicans knew we were serious. I reintroduced the Working Families Tax Relief Act, this time with more Democratic sponsors. We then had 44 out of 46, if you count the Democrats and the two independents. Republicans stepped up their attacks claiming, oh, how they love talking about, about tax fraud for low-income people, uh, and rarely talking about it for others. Republicans stepped up their attacks claiming that EITC was rampant with fraud. No evidence of that. Um, they played with some numbers, they played with some definitions, but no evidence of that. Senate Democrats significantly held together. Corporate lobbyists made the rounds on the Hill like always, but this time we converted them into allies because they were hearing from Democrats our mantra, no tax breaks for corporations without tax breaks for working families. Corporate lobbyists recognized the only way they could get what they wanted, which in the end they always do, so we didn't give them a lot because in the end they always get what they want. They recognized the only way they could get what they wanted, permanent tax provisions for a number of, of some good, some a little less good, corporate provisions was to get what we wanted, permanent EITC and CTC. So they began lobbying Republicans to find a way to get to yes. Finally, after a November hearing, and I, will, I won't mention names, but a particular Republican came out of the committee hearing after we talked about combat, after we combated the misinformation about EITC fraud, which really is improper payments brought on sometimes by IRS mistakes, other times by tax preparers' mistakes, but rarely, rarely, rarely fraud. I was, I was followed out of the finance community by a Republican senator who clearly wanted to do business and clearly was beginning to move on what this tax for this EITC fraud meant. Over the next few weeks, our negotiations with Republicans picked up, a deal was in sight. We organized, we worked with grassroots organizations to remind Democrats how much was at stake for working families, that there was a single mother of two children working full-time on minimum wage, barely getting by on 14,000 a year, and of course she should get a significant tax credit, a refundable tax credit that would make her life better and make her community stronger. She was counting on us to secure her $1,725 child tax credit to make ends meet. Democrats remained united, and because House Republicans knew from experience, this time we would not back down. They had no other choice but to join us. We made the expansion a permanent part of the tax code, bringing certainty to the budgets of millions of families who rely on these credits every January or February or March or April to, to raise their children and save for retirement. That's the good news, but we have more work to do. Under current law, Workers without children, and, and Winnie touched on this, workers without children making minimum wage barely receive any EITC, and childless workers under the age of 25 qualify for zero. That makes young people and workers without children the only groups that literally, think about this, literally can be taxed deeper into poverty. In current law, you make 15000 a year. You're making, say you're making $10 an hour. You're making a little bit, say 15 a year or you know, minimum wage or $10 an hour, 20000 a year. If you have no children, those workers barely receive earn, earn any earned income tax credit, as I said. But if they're under 25, they get zero. That means a young worker can actually be taxed into poverty. They're working. They pay payroll tax. They pay state and local sales taxes. And they are... They're, wherever they are in their, their minimal income, their low income place, they are taxed into poverty. Those taxes can push them below the poverty line, the, the, the most important reason to expand the ICC. The final budget of his presidency, President Obama has proposed expanding the EITC by reducing the eligibility age from 25 to 21 and doubling the maximum value of the credit. Step in the right direction, but it doesn't go far enough. We need to both expand the size of the EITC for all workers without children, and we need to expand access for young workers. We should combine the tax credit with an increase in the minimum wage to $15 an hour to make sure a hard day's work is rewarded with an honest day's pay. 
how are young work understand that minimum wage today has one third less buying power than it did when I started in politics? How are young workers going to plan families or plan for their futures if they're already struggling paycheck to paycheck? More than half of Americans, I think you, you're, you're, all of you here at CAP know these kinds of numbers and these kinds of hardships, but more than half Americans um, are so cash strapped they wouldn't be able to come up with $400 without selling something they own or borrowing money. And where do they go to borrow money? So they, go to, they go to a payday lender. What if instead a cash-strapped low-income worker could get an advance in the TITC she's already earned? Think about this. A woman's uh, making $11 an hour. She's raising a child. She's a single parent or not. Um, she, her car breaks down um, in October. She's already earned, her in, she's already earned nine-twelfths through September, nine-twelfths of her earned income tax credit, but she can't get it till February or March when she files. How about giving her a $500 advance? Not, not, a, not a loan, um, not, doesn't cost government, it's a $500 advance, she will get $500 the next year. How about giving her that $500 advance in October? That way she doesn't have to go to a payday lender and you know what to fix her car and you know what happens when you go to a payday lender. It's just not the first loan of $350 to fix your car. It's the second loan and the third loan and the fourth loan and before you know it you're paying significantly more in interest than the principal of the loan to begin with. Um, that's the kind of innovative thinking, the kind of thing we need to do with earned income tax credit to serve those low income workers um, better than it already does through the refundable tax credit. You know, we say we value hard work in this country. If we mean what we say, it's time to get behind common sense ideas to make hard work pay. Simply expanding the childless EITC alone will lift more than half a million out of poverty and reduce poverty for an additional 10 million. Expanding the EITC means more Americans working. It means that work will pay off. It means more Americans getting GEDs and getting to go to community college and beyond. It means more Americans saving for the future and working to build a better life for their children. The idea that we should be, I mean, it, 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 the idea that we should be rewarding work is a bipartisan one. It's why every president, starting with Gerald Ford in 1975, uh, expanded the uh, created or expanded the EITC. It's why we're able to cut through gridlock and make the EITC expansion permanent last winter. It's why I'm optimistic about other things that CAP recommends and that we've worked on together um, to fight poverty in this country. We must make supporting working families a precondition to our cooperation. Uh, this, this town undoubtedly sings with an upper class accent. This town, or speaks with an upper class accent or whatever we do in this town. And it's important, it's important that we remind people. Lincoln used to say that um, when his, his, his staff wanted him to stay in the White House and win the war and free the slaves and preserve the Union, and Lincoln said, no, I have to go out and get my public opinion baths. In a more modern day, um, Pope Francis exhorted his parish priest to go out and smell like the flock. It's so important in this town that those of us with titles and those of us that dress like this listen to people who struggle every day just to put food on the table, just to support their kids, that have to make terrible choices about medicine and school and paying their rent. Um, all of those things we need to consider. We, my, my wife and I live in Cleveland, Ohio, in zip code 44105. We're expecting some visitors next month in Cleveland. That would not be my personal visitors, but about 10,000 of them. But the zip code we live in had more foreclosures in 2007 than any zip code in the United States of America. Think about the personal side of that, what it means, what all of these issues of poverty mean. And it's so important that we address it. We address these. We did it last winter with EITC. If we follow this model with EITC, with overtime rule, with things that we know how to do and stick together as progressives, uh, we can change this world and we can make this country a better place to live. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Brown, for your leadership on these issues and for fighting for working families every single day. The policies that are, were outlined by Senator Brown would have a real and tangible impact on improving the lives of struggling families across the country and paving a path to the middle class. In contrast, just a few miles from here, just this morning, congressional Republicans are releasing a poverty plan that does nothing to create jobs or raise wages, but rather would exacerbate poverty and inequality by undermining many of the core investments that have been so successful in preventing hardship and boosting economic mobility. This plan cannot be viewed separately from their budget, 
which just weeks ago proposed getting three-fifths of, of its cuts from programs helping low- and moderate-income families while protecting tax breaks for millionaires and corporations. The progressive blueprint that Center for American Progress is discussing today stands in sharp contrast. In it, we propose strategies to create good jobs, to raise wages, to invest in families, and to strengthen basic living standards. Recent research has underscored the important effects that policies such as raising the minimum wage, ensuring paid family and sick leave, and fair scheduling practices can have on improving family economic security. But it is thanks to the courage of workers across the country that these issues are now on the national agenda in a way that makes it impossible for policymakers to ignore them. These workers have organized in cities and in states across the country, drawing on their lived experience to advocate for fair wages and a better life for them and their families. No event discussing an anti-poverty agenda would be complete without their voice. I'm therefore honored to be able to introduce our next distinguished speaker, someone who has direct and lived experience with many of the issues we are talking about today. Jessica Howard Winter Martin is a DC resident, born in New York and most recently living in the Bay Area where she graduated from UC Berkeley. She has spent 10 years working in the restaurant industry. Despite working full time, despite graduating from college, Jessica knows what it's like to struggle financially to work three jobs at once and still need to turn to nutrition assistance and food banks, to have to make impossible decisions about whether or not to be there for your family or missing a day's pay because you don't have paid sick leave. But she's not standing by. She's a vocal advocate for the rights of working families and in particular for tipped workers as an active member of the board of the Restaurant Opportunity Center, better known as ROC. I'm pleased to welcome her today to share her story and to speak to the kinds of policies that would enable her to reach the middle class. Thank you everyone for having me here today. I really appreciate you guys giving me your time and consideration and the very wise words of Senator Brown, just really powerful. It's inspiring for me to know that there's at least someone here in, in our Congress that really is representing us and thinking progressively about policy. And I do wanna address you know, a lot of what we're hearing about what's being presented uh, on the other side of town is a lot to do with cuts, uh, cuts to our safety nets, cuts to whatever reform programs we can have. And I'm a bit confused here on some on, on what's kind of going on. Are we trying to eliminate poverty? Or are we trying to eliminate people living in poverty? And I think we need to really address this concern and this issue. What causes people to live in this situation? So let me speak a bit about my personal experience here. Uh, my mother was a server. My father was a chef. They met together in New York in the same restaurant. So I always say I was born and raised, really conceived in this in the industry, in the restaurant industry. All of my life, I've either been in a restaurant, been around a restaurant. When my first little kitchen, when I was five years old, washing dishes and prepping, prepping food. First job when I was 15 years old as a busser, work as a host, food runner, server, but every position in a restaurant you could think. And I could talk a lot about what goes on in there, but I'll just stick to the, the things that relate to, to labor and wages. Um, I've lived in very different states, as was mentioned. I actually, most of my experience is in California and city of San Francisco, which had, at the time, the nation's highest wages. And what a huge difference that made on the industry, on the people, on, on our food, on the service, on our lives. Of course, as we all know, the cost of living in San Francisco is tremendously high. So despite those incredibly high wages, that meant just about nothing for anyone actually living in San Francisco. But for, me, for someone like me who lived on the other side of the Bay with much lower cost of living, but working there, it, may, it meant that I could work, you know, at times just one job, pay my bills and move on. It was nice, it was comforting. Of course, when I moved, finished college, moved out on my own, so I had to start paying rent, things got a little bit different. And that's where I had started to experience having to work two, three jobs. Sometimes, actually when I moved here to DC, I left four jobs over there. And I, there was definitely at times a bit of a struggle. The hardest part really of this is when I came here to DC though. The biggest difference being in the restaurant industry, working, living in D.C. or in San Francisco, is the three key words, which is one fair wage. That is what we had in California, we have on the West Coast. Seven states have one fair wage. What does that mean? That means everyone is paid one fair minimum wage. See, here in D.C., my wage as a server is $2.77 an hour. 
let that sink in for a moment. See, everybody here, you don't maybe not didn't know that. Every server, every bartender, your bussers, even people in other positions we never knew were tipped. We talked about people who work in airports pushing wheelchairs and consider tipped workers. They're making sometimes as little as $5 an hour or less because people thought they're supposed to be tipped. But think about that for a moment. I know a lot of us in here love to go to happy hour. Get a nice little drink, a little $1 yingling, $3 cocktails. And so the next time you go to happy hour and your bartender hands you that $3 cocktail, realize that you're paying more for that cocktail than their employer is paying them for an entire hour to be there. Constantly churning out drinks, passing out foods, little $2 bites, $1 beers. That's all they're getting paid by their employer to work. And that's really the struggle I've, I've dealt with in my personal experience. I like to work. I like to do work that's right. I like to help people. I like to be active, enjoy my life, and live comfortably. I'm, I'm not saying I want to sit on the couch and do nothing all day. I, w I don't mind going to work. I'm happy with that. If that's what I need to do to be a responsible adult, I'm okay with that. But what needs to happen here and what we need to consider with policy is that we're, we need to be able to work full time and pay our bills. And not just barely pay our bills, but pay all of them on time, every month. Every bill should be topped off. Our gas tank should be full. Our metro card should be, should be refilled. We should be able to update our wardrobes every now and then. You know, just every now and then, even at the secondhand store. We should be able to go visit family. And that's something I've experienced as well. Despite one fair wage being in California, there weren't protections as far as paid family leave and sick leave. So when my aunt, who lives here on the East Coast, we were on the West Coast at the time, when my aunt suddenly passed, uh, we had to make a really tough decision. Despite both of us working for the exact same employer, for my mother had been there for almost five years at the time, I had been there for two years at the time, neither of us were going to get any paid family leave or sick leave. In fact, it was because we were friends with the general manager that we got the benefit of being able to take up to a week off and still have our job when we came back. That was considered a privilege. And we had to decide for ourselves and really sit and question who could afford to take time off, who, was, who needed to be there. Did I, and we had to decide and had to make the tough choice that I wasn't able to say goodbye to my aunt. My mother, we had to schedule her every, every bit of my aunt's funeral and, and death preparation around the fact that my mother only had seven days, including flying time, to go from California to, to, to Baltimore to view the body, to sign away power of attorney, to do, to do the cremation, and orchestrate a service. It was very stressful. And when, just to make things better, when we came back, we had missed out an entire week of our highest income earners' wages in the house and had nothing to fall back on because my wages simply weren't enough. It was tough, it was rough, and I never got to say goodbye. The same thing when my grandma passed, equally as suddenly. And again, when my, my, my father's side, we're Jamaican, so we took her back to home, to Jamaica, where she was from. Never got a chance to say goodbye. Never got a chance to even go out to New York and just help view the body and just be a part. Never got a chance to support my father and my uncles and aunts, who were definitely struggling with the sudden loss of their mother. The best I could do was call, send a text message, because that's all I could afford. It was harsh. It's, it's rough and it's tough when you're working full time, working for the same employer for years, and you're just barely getting by, and you can't even just say goodbye because there's no protections for working people. And I think that's really what we need to bring to this narrative here as everyone discusses what's going, what's going on as far as dealing with our workers and dealing with poverty. People don't understand that people are working in poverty. Right downstairs, at Cozy, at Pret a Manger, at little establishments, we all walk through here to get our bagels and get our coffee. These people are working full time and they're not making ends meet. I know we've all heard a lot of stats, but I'm just gonna throw one or two more just to give you a concept of what's going on here. We're discussing a lot of a $15 an hour minimum wage, $15 an hour minimum wage increase. In fact, there's a ballot initiative here in the district and there's legislation that's actually being voted on as we speak by the city council. As we speak, the city council is deciding and voting on a $15 an hour minimum wage increase. If you do the math, working 40 hours a week, that's $31,000 a year before taxes. Now, an average wage of a one, the uh, rate of a one bedroom apartment here in DC is $2,100. So do that math and ask yourself, is that really a living working wage? Can you work full time and, and take care of yourself and pay your bills on just $15 an hour minimum wage? And yet when I go out and I canvas to get this on the ballot, I often hear they don't deserve $15. $15 is too much. Starbucks workers don't need that. But it's not about whether or not you think that 
filling up lattes, pouring cocktails and beers is a difficult enough job to earn $15 an hour. What we need to change the narrative is to what is the cost of living? What does it cost to survive? What do we really need? And everyone here in this room and all of our legislators need to think to ourselves, what are the creature comforts? If I took away all the, the superfluous things and cut myself down to the basics, what do I need and what does that cost? And what are we now being paid? And is that equal? We're not saying that we deserve to go have, as it was mentioned before by Senator Brown, Swiss bank accounts and offshore. We're not saying we want to go skiing every now and then or take five or six vacations a year. We're talk I'm talking about being able to bury my aunt and my grandmother. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being able to take time off work. If you want to know something in the restaurant industry, we never take time off when we're sick, just so you know. We, <laughs> we come in there. I've come in unfortunately sick to my gills and I just bring the ingredients with me to make a cup of tea in the back and try not to get yelled at too much for drinking tea on the job because I would be coughing a contagious <laughs> illness into your food but I cannot afford to take the day off work they will not give me that time I will lose my job if I keep requesting time off this is what we're dealing with here we're talking about people who deserve the right to to pay their bills to support themselves since I've moved here to the district, I have worked full time, sometimes 50 hours a week and taken my paycheck right to the Human Services Administration, have them look at it and say, oh, yeah, you can definitely get some food stamps. Worry not. Do you want TANF? Do you want <laughs> and have them look at my paycheck and say, yes, here are all the benefits you can get despite having 50 hours per week on your paycheck. No time to look for another job. No time to do anything else but go to work. And yes, you can apply for benefits. I've had to pull out my paycheck and pull out my phone and pull out a calculator and pull up the law about wage theft and about the minimum wage, the tip minimum wage, and argue with my employer about why I'm not being paid accurately and why I deserve to just get the minimum wage, the 1050. And it's such a, such a struggle because the system as it is, it's broken. You don't want to, people don't want to pay their workers. Employers don't want to pay their workers for the job that they're doing. But this is what we need to make happen. And so by progressive policy, like raising the earned income tax credit, as Senator Brown discussed, like, like as discussed, working families legislation that will increase our wages, create one fair wage nationwide. We have 277 in D.C. Virginia next door is 213 an hour. And it's been at that since 1991. What ha at all has been the same price since 1991? Not, an, not a single thing even if you adjust for inflation. So we need to think progressively, think about not just eliminating people who are poor, but eliminating the conditions that have made them in this, put them in this position. And that's what we all need to take away from here and go to our legislators and go to our senators and go to those who are down at a rehab center because clearly that's where all people in poverty are doing. We're all at rehab centers all the time, right? We're not working and paying our bills. Um, and let them know that if you do, if you actually raise our wages and take care of us, give us what we need, we won't need food stamps. We don't want stamps. We don't want welfare. We don't want these things. We want to work. Make it so that we can work and we can make that work. Thank you. Good. I'm afraid she might run against me and leave me. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Where do you want me? Right here. That's okay, great. right here. Thank you so much, Jessica, for your comments. Uh, I think it really illustrate to us what uh, what really centers this conversation about poverty in the United States, which is that we have people. We have people who are. Uh, just trying to do right by their families, just do trying to do right by their communities, uh, who are struggling in today's economy. And the work we put out today is really uh, centered on figuring out how we have policies that help people in today's economy work jobs that pay them a decent wage, uh, can be good family, have responsibilities at home and at work that they're, that they're really meeting. Uh, it is not about some group over there. It's about people who are neighbors and friends and 
uh, what we can do to help them succeed so we all succeed and our economy thrives. So I'm really honored to have Steny Hoyer here, who has been a fantastic friend of the center, but has also been a tremendous champion in the House of, of Representatives and who has done battle when conservatives have really tried to pit Americans a, against the poor and have, has done battle for a whole series of ideas, minimum wage, earned income tax credit, that are really designed to help families uh, live, just basically live in, in today's economy. And uh, the ideas we released today are, are essentially about having an economy that's working for working families. So I really want to just get your opening thoughts about what you, where you see the debates, how you see uh, Representative Ryan's ideas, and what you think a, a good response to that are. Well, first of all, uh, obviously the American people don't think the Congress is working. And uh, they're right. Uh, the Congress of the United States for the last number of years now has been dysfunctional and not operating on behalf of the American people. And they're angry about that. They understand that. They're not sure who's responsible. They blame us all. Um, but they are very uh, uh, convinced that, that their board of directors of their country is not working yeah. and is not focused on them and doesn't care about their plight. Uh, Jessica was uh, extraordinarily articulate, I think, in explaining the frustration uh, that uh, people who are working hard, and they know they're working hard, uh, and they can't make it. Uh, Jessica, we have a, an agenda in, in, that we call Make It in America, which means succeeding in America. It also means manufacturing goods, which I've talked about here. But uh, you mention it, and, and here we are at a time when Paul Ryan has now put a much ballyhooed uh, agenda on the table. Now, I haven't seen the agenda, but we know uh, essentially uh, what it's done. And frankly, uh, it's a new spin on a bad deal. Uh, it's not anything new. Uh, it will be, as Republicans have suggested in the past, block grants uh, for programs that are designed to make sure, uh, and, and I understand, Jessica, what you're saying about people don't want food stamps, but we don't want people to go hungry either. So if they're not making enough, we want to make sure that they, they and their children have sustenance uh, so that uh, when we block grant programs, almost inevitably block grant means reducing. Yeah. And while the rhetoric, uh, I'm sure that uh, will be in this document, sounds good, uh, sounds aspirational and visionary, uh, the reality uh, behind it uh, will be uh, an, an empty promise of trying to bring people out of poverty, which is why I appointed uh, uh, Barbara Lee, I'm, so, I'm sorry she can't be here today, uh, to a task force that we have under the WIP operation uh, on, uh, on poverty, inequality, and opportunity. Uh, because if we're going to expand the middle class, which is absolutely essential, rather than shrinking the middle class, we need to bring people uh, who are poor into the middle class, who have a living wage. And there's so many things we can do, and you mentioned the minimum wage, EITC, education, investment in, in uh, uh, infrastructure, create jobs. There's so many things that we need to be doing that we are not doing uh, in uh, the Congress of the United States. And there is a central premise that, uh, in my view, maintains among the majority party. Uh, and that is essentially... Majority party in the Congress. The Congress, <laughs> in the Congress. Uh, my perspective. <laughs> thank, Just explain Thank it. heavens we have the presidency, <laughs> or things would be a lot worse in my view. Uh, but essentially the basic premise is you're on your own. This is not our role as a government. I mean, philosophically. Uh, there are a lot of folks in the Congress of the United States just don't believe that's our role. Um, whether it's minimum wage, whether it's child care, whether it's equal pay, whether it's uh, uh, voting rights, uh, uh, you can go through a list of 20 issues. Yeah. The basic premise underlying the approach of the majority party in the House of Representatives and the United States Senate, in my opinion, is you're on your own. That's not our role. And as a result, we have a lot of people frustrated, a lot of people angry, and a lot of people hurting in America, uh, which in the richest country on the face of the earth should not be the case. So I think, um, uh, I think that 
one of the things that really people kind of scratch their head at in, in the country right now is, it used to be a kind of uh, bipartisan idea uh, that, you know, the best way to address poverty is to have good jobs that pay people um, a decent wage. And at least have, you know, jobs as an answer to poverty. And but now we, we're living in a world where you have folks who are saying they want to be about opportunity but oppose a minimum wage increase. You know, and I, we can go through all the statistics. I'm sure people have heard them all before, probably heard them today about how the minimum wage is really a, much less than what it would be if it was you keeping know, up with inflation. You know, I heard Sherrod Brown as we were coming in. He said it was the third less. Actually, uh, it's 48 percent less than it was in 1968. It ought to be 1070 today if all you did was escalate it by uh, inflation from 1968. It would be $10.70. So when you mention $15, that gets close to a living wage. Uh, it may not be at a living wage, as Jessica pointed out. I'm a rent alone in a, in, a, in a city. I don't know how the workers who work in New York City or San Francisco or Washington, D.C. Uh, live here. Yeah. Uh, and if we don't recognize, as Jessica's pointed out, the fact that people who are working hard uh, get compensated in a way that allows them to live healthily uh, and with some degree of uh, lack of anxiety daily, then you're not going to have this country as strong as you want it to be. Yeah, I mean, you talked a lot about narrative, but I think I think just people get really frustrated with the idea that you can argue that you're for opportunity for getting people out of poverty. Like Speaker Ryan has been saying this for years, and yet on a very basic thing like raising the minimum wage to 1070 or 1010, um, even 1010, you know, the House Republicans have opposed. So what do, how can, you know, I think that's also just in some ways people scratch their head and think the whole system is a joke when something's so basic as that, you know, we talked about this earlier, people are really angry because we can't even do basic things like get a minimum wage increase. What do you say to progressives who, you know, think minimum wage increase is common sense? Oh, oh. Here, oh man, I hope we didn't do that to you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I fell off a ladder. Don't ask. <laughs> right. Well, we're talking about ladders here. In the <laughs> <laughs> and what we're talking about is lack of rungs on that ladder. ladder. Right, right. There are a lot of rungs at the well top done. of the ladder. Well but there done. aren't a lot of rungs in the bottom of the ladder. Yeah. That's and that's really what we're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Uh, and until we focus on those bottom rungs so people can get up those rungs, yeah. uh, we're going to have accidents. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'll just say a word of, uh, I mean, it's almost, I don't need to introduce Rosa DeLauro, uh, but uh, she has been a, again, a true champion fighting, fighting uh, Speaker Ryan's agenda and so many Republicans' agenda these days. Um, so we were just talking about the... the Can I say something on that? And this is going to sound harsh. Speaker Ryan has rhetoric. Yes. There will not be an agenda. I predict to you there will be no bills on the floor of the House of Representatives in the next three or four months that will implement the suggestions in whatever document he puts forward. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Ryan has rhetoric. It is good rhetoric. He, he sells it well. But Ryan's budgets were budgets of retreat, budgets of disinvestment. Uh, and all you have to do is look at his budgets. His budget's disinvested in education, in people, in infrastructure, in job creation. And uh, no less a soul than uh, Hal Rogers, who's the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, referred to sequester as ill-advised and unworkable. Yeah. Uh, and that's the policies we've been pursuing. And it's harmful to the country, and it angers people, and they're correct to be angered. And they, frankly, in this next election, uh, need to uh, vote for those who are prepared to invest in job creation and in them and their families. Rosa Delora, I'm glad Rosa Delora is here. She and I served on the Labor, Health, and Human Services uh, Appropriations Subcommittee together for a very long period long of time. time. Yeah. She is now the ranking member. And Rosa, welcome. I'm sorry about your name. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. well, listen, that's where we moved from one place to another. And 
you know, foolishly decided I should go up and down the ladder to uh, put stuff where it needed to go <laughs> and then fell off. I like I, the story that you were like doing battle with Republicans. Hey, and, listen, uh, sounds good to me. <laughs> I, I would just, and I, you know, I, I, let me just say for one session, because uh, one second, because Ryan has introduced his, um, uh, his so-called uh, effort on, on poverty, which in, in, in effect would increase poverty in the United States. Uh, that's what it's about. But he starts with two false premises. Can I just say, he hasn't introduced anything. He's well, put something on the table that's going to sound I, I got good. It. I got it. But right. But the, the fact of the matter is the document in and of itself starts from two false premises. That in fact nothing has happened with regard to poverty yes. since the war on poverty. Not true, simply not true. It is yes. a distortion, and he tries to fool people with this. We have cut po the poverty rate by 40%, childhood poverty by 35%. His second uh, false premise is that we have spent trillions of dollars, and what he does, what he includes in that basket is all of the programs that we look at to help people get to work. Pell Grants, uh, you know, a whole variety of programs which, in fact, look at how we get people to work. So it, it, one can truly dismiss mm -hmm. what goes from there because of, of, of what he has, you, you know, established. And, and I, I, my, my bottom line on what he has done and where he has been, and, and <clears throat> then he talked about, you know, his budget, which you take a look at, on, on, on every measure, uh, whether it is food assistance, whether it's job training, uh, whether it's health care, uh, Medicaid, housing assistance, you can go down the line. All of those uh, uh, efforts have been cut back. So it's not a serious uh, document and quite frankly one that ought to be dismissed except to say very pointedly that the direction that they would go in is to increase poverty in the United States and we've got to call them out on it. Absolutely. I think, yes. Uh, I, I think I, I, I think it's <coughs> incredibly important to focus on the fact that we have made progress over a long time uh, and despite efforts, despite efforts by conservatives to cut back all these programs over decades, they have succeeded in reducing poverty. I think the broad question, uh, you know, we sort of scratch our heads at is how when you have a budget, which is numbers, you know, Republicans have put forward budgets that actually cut programs that help the poor, how they kind of get away with any kind of rhetoric of ideas to actually address, to help alleviate poverty. It's like well, how the agenda is the opposite of the rhetoric. And I think in some large measures there's a kind of react negative reaction to all of that happening in politics today. Um, and so what do you suggest to us over the next six months or so uh, to kind of call out this essentially just very basic hypocrisy uh, as, we, as we face this, the important debates we're having? To, to some degree, we see this in the presidential campaign, where we have a candidate uh, who says things, he's going to fix things, and things are going to be wonderful. <laughs> how? He doesn't answer how. And the Republican Party has not been answering how either. And in fact, there, well, there are some programs they've admitted work. EITC, we had a bipartisan, and continue, I think, to have some bipartisan support for EITC program, which is probably one of the most effective programs that we have to do what Republicans want to do, that is encourage people to work, but also to make sure that they're, uh, in, in the process of working, they're able to survive and live uh, a, a, a life that is without great anxiety. Uh, so that I think we need to pursue those, but we also, as Rosa says, needs to call out um, very specifically and very pointedly because when they, when people hear in the country, well, we had a war on poverty, it didn't work. Yeah. That's not true. As Rose pointed, there are millions and millions and okay. millions of seniors who are not in poverty today because in the 1960s we adopted programs to make sure that in their senior years uh, they would not be uh, reliant uh, or be in poverty. Uh, and uh, Head Start uh, works. Ronald Reagan said Head Start 
worked. He wanted to invest, but we only have 50 percent. Ronald of, Reagan of was a big champion of the earned income tax credit. Right. <laughs> as was, as was as Expand it. Yeah. You know, we made it. You, you know, we made the child tax credit uh, permanent uh, last December. Thank God. Uh, my, for my view, hello, Gwen Moore. Great Hi. to see you, sweetheart. Hi. How are you, Good everybody? To see you. A real champion here of of, uh, of uh, families overall, uh, but the uh, we should have indexed it to inflation, like we did with Social Security. In your report, your report is poignant in this regard. And I, there was one thing that struck out in a quote: "Child poverty cost the national economy six hundred and seventy-two billion dollars a year." We are foolish if we are not looking at the ways in which we can. Uh, look at what we have done, build on what we have done. Child tax credit ought to be uh, indexed to inflation. We ought to move in the direction of the young child tax credit, where we've had the opportunity to do an op-ed together, uh, yes. Nira, and the $1,500 tax credit to kids that are three years old and younger, uh, younger because by age, those children, the youngest children, are those who are most in poverty in this nation. Quite frankly, I'm going to speak as a, de a Democrat. It, we should not be afraid to build on the programs. You take your, your, your page 18 of your report lists the ways in which people have been lifted out of poverty. 29 million people with Social Security, 4.7 million people with um, with food stamps, with the LIHEAP program, with SSI, um, uh, with the housing programs. We have about two, uh, 2.8 million people between two or three housing programs that have been lifted out of poverty. Child tax credit, 3.1 million people lifted out of poverty, 1.7 million children. We want to do something about it. That's the direction that we need to go. We know how to do it. Democrats do know how to do it. And it's outrageous that one in five kids in this country uh, are in, in, in poverty. But your words, Stenny's words, call them out. Call them out and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and fight back uh, as Democrats. Uh, the country will understand what we are talking about if we take a stand. Rosa only had some passion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I quote, interesting enough, you know, I'm from Maryland, and I was elected to the State Senate in 1966. Spiro T. Agnew was elected governor of our state, and in January of 1967, he gave a speech, his inaugural speech, and I quote a line from that all the time, <clears throat> in which he said, the cost of failure far exceeds the price of progress. By disinvesting in all of those programs, which cost money, of course, but to disinvest in them would be a much greater cost. That's what Agnew meant. Uh, Frederick Douglass said it a, a different way uh, in, in talking about it is easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. And what he meant by that is the same thing Agnew meant. You invest in people now, it is a much better thing to do than to leave them on their own, and it will be more costly to you in the long run. So I it's not only bad uh, uh, humanity and morals, uh, it's bad business. I want to welcome Congresswoman Gwen Moore Thank you, uh, from Wisconsin. She's been active on civil rights issues and a whole host of issues. First African-American <coughs> representative from Wisconsin. We're honored to have you here. I think just to, just to uh, update, I think uh, Congresswoman DeLauro and Congressman uh, Hoyer have really focused on the one-two punch of, the, of what we're facing on the other side. One is to say that everything we've done hasn't worked. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And the second step is to then, you know, cut programs that have worked. The first is the justification for the second. And I think, you know, we've seen over the last several years a kind of libertarian perspective, which has said the government can't do anything right, so we should pull it back, and that's the best way to address poverty ironic as that is. So I think the, the points that have been made that these programs really have worked, and I want to give a shout out to the CAP Poverty Team Yay. over here, who have really done Quite. tremendous work, Melissa and Rebecca, all members of the team, who've done tremendous work to, to provide the analytics that we actually have made progress on reducing 
poverty. These programs have been successful, so that's why we need to actually invest more in them. But even aside from government investment, there's things we could do, like raising the minimum wage, uh, which isn't a government child investment. Care. Child care. I've been supporting businesses to do child care. So I'd love to get your perspective on really what are the top <coughs> issues you think we could we should tackle to address these issues, and then how we can uh, make clear the, where the Republicans are in these debates. Well, you know, uh, as, as I was inching my way here and this traffic morning. traffic is terrible. Um, That's a government service we do need to improve. Yeah. Um, uh, the staff that was with me who have my notes with them, but I think I can make it. You didn't bring my phone, like I told you to. As I was inching my way here, you know, one of the comments that my staff made, and, and it's very, very true. At one point, you think you're going to educate lawmakers about poverty. You're going to roll out the center's research and, and, and proof that these programs have worked. You're going to rattle off all these data that uh, Representative DeLauro, and you're somehow going to convince the Paul Ryans of the world that uh, you're going to enlighten them uh, as to the needs of, of poverty and, and explain why half of all Americans at some point in their lives fall into poverty. Um, I, and, 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 and Rosa, you know, I, I, I wasn't able to catch up with the whole conversation, but you said something I think is an extremely important lead in to what I'm going to say. You said we gotta take it right to them. We have got to really question uh, their uh, you know, their characterization of poor people as broken people, people who need to be fixed. Yeah. People, Paul Ryan, as we speak, is rolling out his poverty initiative at a drug rehab center. Now, God knows we need drug rehab. I'm all for drug rehab. But what is the narrative there? Sure. The narrative is, is that oh, why didn't he go to McDonald's or to a fast food restaurant and, 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 and interview someone <laughs> who was at their second job That's trying right. to make it? Exactly. exactly. Why, why didn't he go to one of these shuttered factories uh, to sort of explain why People who had worked and had some incentive to work in the past uh, hadn't worked. Why, why didn't he go mm -hmm. uh, to a daycare center, you know, and talk to the daycare provider to, who expl they explained the attrition of people, you know, as soon as they make $9 an hour, suddenly they're no longer eligible for daycare, yeah. and they're leaving their six-year-old kids at home. I know people like this, leaving their six-year-old kids at home telling them to make a sandwich and don't open the door. Right. You mm -hmm. know, or they're at their second job and there's some 14-year-old babysitting and not getting their homework done. Yeah. And not participating in sports or after-school activities. <clears throat> um, you know, why aren't they explaining why people's happily ever after is it? I mean, you tried to, to stay with the man so you could have a two-parent family, a two-parent home, except you know, the frustration over not having a job, you were getting your behind kicked every day. And our policies, as you've pointed out in your reports, there's rhetoric around supporting families, but our TANF policy doesn't support families staying oh, together. Yeah. Um, you know, honest to God, poor women would have stormed the White House a generation ago if, if the, the rhetoric of welfare reform matched up with what our policies do. If we gave people a hand up instead of a handout, oh my God, that, that would be something to look forward to. Women would not be um, uh, uh, the low wage workers that they, that they are. I mean, what is it, Rosa? Two thirds of all minimum wage workers are, are women. women. You know, mm -hmm. uh, households, uh, uh, women are 50% of the workforce. And I mean, what percentage of those households 
would have even a, a, a struggling chance, two parent households, of making ends meet without the women's income. This women's income is not so that they can buy prom dresses for their daughter or, or, or Kwanzaa or, or, or Christmas gifts at the end of the year. Um, and so I think that, that, you know, I once, and I'm gonna shut up, I, I once wrote an editorial, I was telling my staff, I've looked all over for it, the paper claims they can't find it. But I am very, very uh, upset with the bipartisan end welfare as we know it uh, um, uh, catastrophe. Uh, and, you know, you know, Democrats and Republicans congratulating themselves over how they did it. When the whole goal of that, when I said at that time, is that Social Security was a three-legged stool. It was retirement security, it was support for the disabled, and it was support for, for women and children. And once <laughs> we ag all agreed to tear off one leg of that stool, it wasn't gonna be long before they come after the other. And so what do we see? We are in a constant battle to keep them from block granting <coughs> food stamps, block granting Medicaid, you know, block granting, uh, getting rid of entitlements and convincing the American people that this is the only way to go. Their goal with all their rhetoric is just to cut, 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 and to end this, the, the entire Social Security program. And I think we have to just take it to them straight uh, and, and stop pretending that we're trying to teach them anything. You know, I feel very and good sister. that I never, uh, never voted for the welfare reform. I know you did. I, I know never you voted did. for it. I, 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 you know? and, and, but me, it's I very, know. It's very interesting here, the way they characterize uh, in their report today. And I, I just scanned it. I really need to take a deeper dive. But the way they talk about a welfare system but within that system, as I say, it's every housing program, it's every education program, it's every job training program, it is all of the nutrition programs. They view that, that is where they come from, that these are programs that are welfare. It's not about where Reagan came from with an earned income tax credit that has helped to lift so many people. Or the Pell you know, Grant, which uh, is out of poverty. Or up. the Pell Grant, which is now what they're prepared to do is to dip into that surplus for Pell and spend it on other things. They're, 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 uh, the Education and Workforce Committee, and God bless Bobby Scott, who, who was the ranking member there, but, and we're fighting that this week. In the reauthorization of the child nutrition bill, they are going to block grant uh, for three states, the school lunch program. Now, Stenny, you were there in 1995 when Newt Gingrich said that we were going to take this nationwide. And we fought back. And we got the nation to fight back. And we said no. And when you think of what the school lunch program <coughs> has done to lift people out of poverty, I just want to say one more thing. We were in a really very pivotal moment. Think about the issue of minimum wage and the $15 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I increase and what's happened nationwide with that. Think about the nature of the public discourse in the presidential election. Issues that were regarded as fringe not that many years ago. Paid sick days, paid family leave, equal pay for equal work, affordable <coughs> child care. Those issues are now the center of the debate, which is when I say this is our moment. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is yeah. our moment to grab hold mm -hmm. and that we need to get the same kind of traction on those programs like paid sick <coughs> days, uh, minimum, uh, well, minimum wage I think is there that the same kind of momentum there in order to be able to help to turn the debate and the dialogue around. So it's, it's, it's ours. We need to take it on. Now I know, Congressman Hoyer, you have to go. So I want to just Let give me, you a final oh, word and then we'll, but we'll continue. Let me just close uh, with the general <coughs> premise 
I think Rosa and Gwen have really nailed it in terms of the specifics uh, issues that we're talking about. But let me go back to my theme. Philosophically, the Republican leadership in the House and the Senate believe that people should be on their own and we would be better for it in the long term. Let me give you a specific example. Jessica, you find yourself a lot in the storm of life. Well, we had a major uh, historical storm that hit the Atlantic coast, whose name was Sandy. Yeah. And we fought to get some help for those people who had been battered through no fault of their own. They weren't lazy. They weren't uh, malingering. They weren't doing any of those things. And we put that bill on the floor. We put it late. We tried to get it. Rosa and I fought and Gwen fought to get it on the floor immediately. But it was late. Only 49 Republicans out of about 240 voted to give help to those who had been battered by Sandy. And about three months later, it was, and, and they wouldn't do it immediately. Right. They wouldn't <laughs> do it was late. It but even late. So when, when you have that concept, know you're on your own. All this other lack of policy, lack of investment, lack of energy uh, to help people uh, hand up to get mm -hmm. Pell Grants. Pell Grants are an investment. They're not an expenditure. Right. And they're the best expend investment that you make because you invest in your people. You invest in their ability to help you compete Work. in the world economy and create jobs. They're investments, but unfortunately, Republicans look at all this as, as just a, an expense. If business looked at that, uh, everything as just an expense as opposed to an investment, uh, they would go bankrupt. Uh, so it's the general philosophy. Yes, we have to confront them on specifics, but we got to say, no, we are in this together. That's what our country is about. And when we lift up others, we lift up ourselves as well. Uh, and that is the kind of uh, response that I think we need to get. I haven't seen Paul Ryan's document yet, but I know it's going to be great rhetoric. I know it's going to have a wonderful vision. It's going to increase poverty. It's going to have a city... <laughs> And it's going to have a city on the hill. Increase poverty. But it will, as Rosa says, disinvest in our people, in our children, in the richest country on the face of the earth. It is bad business and bad morals. Thank you for allowing Thank me you. to be with you. Great. Good job. Great. Sorry to be late. So. Okay. Yeah, well, what the heck. Hairline okay. fracture. So. You've got two of our... Most fiery, powerful women in the Congress of the United States right here. Well, You're going to be in good very low key. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, we'll take questions in a, in a second, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just ask one, uh, one question off of uh, Steny's remarks, uh, Congressman <coughs> Hoyer's remarks, which is essentially the rhetoric, which is to, uh, to, to alleviate poverty, but the policies, which is to make poverty worse. Um, I think, you know, I think we all understand that there's been kind of a 30-year war on government and that, you know, everything the government does is a failure. And that's really driven by a strategy to have low taxes so we have less investment, um, which actually really helps uh, maybe one party's donors. But... How do you see us reverse that trend? What can we do, just not for the next few months, but for the coming years, to make people understand that these programs are working, that government actually is helping solve problems? Well, look, I, I, I would just say this. I, I, I suppose bottom line is we win elections and we change the nature of the folks who serve. Okay, put that <laughs> aside for a second, uh, and I'm optimistic that we can get to where we want to go in that regard. But I, I would just say this to you, which I think that this is something that um, Senator Sanders has uh, opened the yeah. gate on. Mm -hmm. And that is the way that government doles out benefits to corporations and to special interests. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, that's what this country believes. You cannot get people's attention unless you address the issue of reforming the system, that we should do something about the special interests, that they're getting all of the benefits, and that there is a corruption there 
that we need to fix. And quite frankly, really hear you. he opened that door. And what we have seen then is that you can move in and then talk about if you were able to deal with the, the special interests and curtail them and not provide them with all of the benefits, that in fact you could bring some sense of relief to their lives. They're, try they're struggling. Their wages have been stagnant. Yeah. They know that. Uh, and, uh, and, and we've got a whole group of folks who will tell them that it's because of globalization or technology that their income is stagnant. Wrong. It's the deliberate policy choices that we have made over the years that have created this problem. But they do not believe us because they don't think that we're on the level either side with looking at that. And I believe it is a gateway issue to opening up the door for us to talk about a whole variety of issues that we're talking about today, that we can do these things for our working men and women. We can do these things to lift people out of poverty. That's great. Thank you. Congressman Wolf. Amen to everything that Rosa has said. You know, I think it's extremely important in this war for the narrative to make people realize that it's not this group of people. Like we talked about yeah. the welfare queen in the 80s <coughs> with the 80, you know, different names and how many ever social security numbers. And so it was very easy to adopt this we and they attitude toward people. When people realize that half of all Americans will at some point be, be, be poor, you lost your job, you developed cancer, you, you know, you got three kids in school at one time, your, your husband ran off with his secretary, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he died. Um, when after people, he ran off. After <laughs> he ran off. Well, you'd be better off Serve if you right. were dead. <laughs> Before. But I mean, I, I, I think, I think that we have got to fight this, you know, this, like the whole food stamp thing. Yeah. Think about uh -huh. the yeoman's effort that they're making to characterize food stamp recipients as these uh, ne'er-do-well, lazy bums who won't go to work. And we keep saying, but two-thirds of these households have elderly, disabled or children in them. Am I wrong about these data? I'm with no, the data no. people. Yeah, you're right. And, 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 you're and right. as many <laughs> times as we say that, it's not, we've got to make people, we have got to bring this full circle and yeah. say, you know, we have, and, and Bernie Sanders can help us with these kinds of messages, you know, we have a healthcare system, for example, that rewards you if you're working. But at some point, all of us don't work. I mean, we're infants, we're 80, we're sick, we're just playing, we're in school, we're just plain old unemployed or between jobs. And so preparing a medical safety net for everybody mm -hmm. is in all of our interests. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter if you live, you know, in Central Park and you've got the best health care uh, available to you. If everybody in Harlem is going to develop Zika, you're in trouble. <laughs> If, if you don't invest yeah. in, 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 in everybody's health, you know, you can't isolate yourself. No, that's a great point. You know, you know th th this, this commission or this task force that they put together, it's not a commission, it's a task force. And we actually did up a flyer. You, you know, it, it's the, um, who are they, okay? First of all, the, the task force is all Republican. Then we took a look at several measures, food stamps, Pell Grants, housing assistance, Medicaid, et cetera. And then we overlaid the voting record. Every single person voted, voted against the All measures. Of it, yeah. So as I say, what we, what we, and, and we need to describe where they're going yeah. very deliberately, graphically, be unafraid to talk about the Ryan plan, the Republican plan, the Trump plan, whatever it is, and that it is about increasing poverty. I was at, with Secretary Clinton in New Haven, Connecticut, in a round table, 
and the young woman spoke. She, has, she was in the nursing field, had a great job, single mom taking care of her daughter. They had a home in a lovely section of the city of New Haven. She gets hit by a car, so she can't work. And she has to, her health care benefits. Her health care benefits are being held up. She is going, to, is going to lose her home. She's fearful every single day that she and her daughter will go home and everything that they have will be on the street. She can't work now, but she was working. She was gainfully employed. She was doing her job. She was taking care of her family. She had a home. She was paying her taxes. And the secretary commented, why? And, you know, our office is going to work with her to try to get her health care benefits. But why is she in this situation where she is facing foreclosure, no health care benefits, no job? And, and when you read this report, or, or at least scan this report so far, they talk about the work of local organizations, of charitable organizations, of so forth. It is the, 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 the point that... that government and the federal government has no role and what we have discovered with all of those programs earned income tax credit child tax credit uh, 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 paid leave but those are not in effect yet but those that are the the food assistance programs the housing assistance lie heap all of those programs are federal programs yeah. it is the federal government it is working but it is about getting the attention of the American people. And I think when you do have candidates, our candidates, who are describing these issues, uh, and, uh, 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 and, you know, Secretary Clinton is the presumptive nominee or, or you know, a short way to go. We have to wait, till we have to wait <laughs> until after tonight. But I am just saying that the debate and the dialogue on our side has been formidable in allowing this yes, space totally agree. to open up for those of us who are running down ballot, whatever it is, to be able to categorize this discourse and this debate uh, in a way that we can gain traction and let people know uh, who is on their side on these issues. Fantastic. I want to. I know we have a limited oh, time, we so have. I just want to have time for maybe one or two questions, if you guys need. Sure. And if you could just identify yourself, the <laughs> mic will come to you. If you can identify yourself, uh, that would be great. Hi, Pamela Miller. It was really important for me to come today. I came in from Philadelphia because I'm one of the three, and I wanted to put a face on it. I fell in um, 2009 and sustained a major trauma. And then that giant sucking sound came into my bank account called health care costs. That I went on CalCobra, more health care costs. It was more important, my recovery. In 2011, I returned to school back at Temple University in Philadelphia. And, um, and at that time, for the first time in my entire life, I had to access government benefits. First time in my entire life. Um, <coughs> it was the hardest thing I ever did because of the response I got from people, the humiliation. I have a lot of friends that are journalists, and I have friends who are editors at Vanity Fair, and I used to call one of them a lot in tears because people would count my bags. I have brain trauma, so I would forget things. I would shop a lot in the Rite Aid store, because I would forget things, not write down what I needed. I'm recovering from brain trauma. I fell on my head. Um, they would count my bags. They would look if I actually bought mascara like I didn't deserve it. And at the time- That's right, that's right. It is, it right. is how you cheat. And I would sure. cry, and I would call John, and I'd say, little do they know that I'm so upset that I have to get the Maybelline, and I wish I could get Lancome. The days that I, you know, right. years ago, I, before I fell, I was making $75,000, you know, and now I'm barely making 10000 struggling, and there was a five-year period from when I fell until I could get Social Security benefits. And what I have found, people, like what I call the real people in the real world that are still working, when they find out how little you get, they don't know. 
I always got $200 a month when I was on welfare, and my food stamps were $130. Now, please, I'll go right and testify in Congress. If you think that was high standard of living, if you think that I was Game out in there, the system. Yeah, uh, that Not I was doing anything. Not on the thrifty program. It's the lowest level of the With food that, stamp I program. actually <laughs> did buy my textbooks. I wasn't doing much else. And I took out a lot of, I got a lot of loans, was paying for, for the college part. That part was until I got a, a scholarship. Um, and then when I was on scholarship, I had to fight every semester, as everyone does, for disability to get my accommodations because it's so hard still, even though there's a federal law, it's still so hard. You'll get a professor every semester that'll say to you, well, I don't really want to deal with disability, do it my way. So you're doing that every single semester. Then you'll get a call right around midterms. You find out they're cutting off mm -hmm. your food stamps. You have to go up there and deal with that. I saw hundreds and hundreds of people lining up. People are hurting because of the recession. Yeah. Philadelphia has a very high poverty rate. So a lot of the inner cities do. But again, people are not, um, I just came, the Acquired Brain Injury Network of Pennsylvania wanted to let people know that 33,000 people in Pennsylvania got cut from getting um, food stamps on June 1st. So you're talking about things you're going. trying to help. And, but I don't hear anything about you know, stemming what's going on now. Um, very few people are getting actual TANF benefits. You have to be, yeah, you have to point. have a kid. Uh, Pennsylvania yeah. cut everybody, disa all disabled people are off the rolls in Pennsylvania. You can die in the street and be disabled, you can't get anything. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of the states yeah. are. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't want to go on and on. I'm just saying that, so that the, the, we really do helpful. have a huge problem in this country. But a lot of it also brought me back, women, uh, uh, really brought me back to being, I already was a feminist, but a really hardcore feminist, because so much of this is economic. Women have got to wake up that $15 an hour, that two-thirds of women are making just minimum wage, that we're not getting paid what we should get, we're not getting the benefits, we're the most vulnerable. Um, I did my own Emily's List. I have a thank you note from Senator Brown. I worked on Wendy Davis's campaign, Terry McAuliffe's campaign. I'll be at a party tonight for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> um, and Senator Cory Booker invited me to a swearing in. I gave money to every Democrat running for the Senate last year. It was the hardest night of my life, that election. I hope this fall we get the Senate back and Great. the presidency. Yeah, we will. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for sharing your story. Yeah. I think... Uh, yeah, yeah. Let, uh, let other people... Yeah. Okay. Let other people, yeah. Yeah, we have some reporters. We've got some other think? questions, and then we can... Max Aaron, Max Aaron from the Washington Post. Yeah. Um, I am very interested in what Congresswoman Moore said a moment ago about two-parent families and two-parent households, and I'm just wondering if uh, any of you folks would be interested in saying a little bit more about that. Do you think that two-parent families are better off? Do you think that uh, the government has a role to play in promoting marriage and two-parent families? And if so, uh, what should that role be? Well, it, you know, duh. It takes two to tangle, and it takes two people to get a baby. Um, uh, it does, and there are all kind of ways that people get babies. Let me tell you this, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and for like 30 years straight, Milwaukee was in the top 10 in the nation for uh, teenage pregnancies. Uh, and so we had to ask ourselves, I mean, are these the most immoral little divas? Or, <laughs> uh, I mean, what is it? Is it something about the water? Why are all these girls getting pregnant in Milwaukee? You know, and you know, when you look at the model that the Republicans have, it's because you have a flawed character. That's the first go-to assumption. And, and United Way of Greater Milwaukee did a study and they found that these girls were being raped. That, 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 that these children, the, the offspring were products of like statutory, I mean, grown men in their 20s and 30s uh, uh, having sex with, with girls under the age of 16. You know, and of course, all of the uh, recriminations in order to the women yeah. uh, uh, and, and not to the men. 
you know, we have job training programs. They're out looking for men to train um, uh, and indicting women um, um, for it. I, but, but the point I really wanted to make and I was inspired by what she had to say, and, and even what, what you're asking about two-parent families. Um, the, the policy doesn't fit. There, there is no effort. Uh, if there's, a, you know, there's no effort to keep people from hitting these high marginal uh, rates to make sure that a two-family, a, a two-parent family can actually stay together and still receive benefits that they deserve. But, uh, uh, beyond that, the old AFDC program, the admin costs were held at like 10% of the program. Right now, uh, you know, the district from which I hail, I mean, we used TANF money for bonuses and, uh, uh, to pay salaries to for-profit agencies <laughs> where they could earn more money than the governor earned. Um, I have jurisdictions in my congressional district where they fixed the infrastructure so a private uh, enterprise can get in there and build yeah. on the ground with TANF dollars so that while we're busy indicting poor people, uh, the states that have received the TANF dollars and with this so-called flexibility have used the flexibility, there's really been no incentive whatsoever to really actually help people. So the people who would be, could be eligible uh, for the program, they're diverted from help because there is a perverse incentive for the state to keep the money, to yeah. balance the budget, to yeah. do whatever they want to with it. I'd just like What's, to just jump quickly into this. Right. I just want to say something about Congressman Ryan's policies as well. You know, I, I'd say speaking on behalf of CAP, we completely recognize that for kids growing up in poverty, it's great to have two parents involved in their lives. I, you know, it's something that it's great for everyone. I would just make really two points about that. One, uh, the data really shows that a lot of the pressures on families are economic pressures and that marriage is something that's become really a function of inequality in the country. But the irony I see is that we have a Republican Party, or conservatives I should say, arguing for family values at the heart of everything we do when we have policies for poor people that actually incentivize the breakup of families. Just the most basic issue is that in most of the country for TANF, you know, our welfare program, it punishes you if you're married. Mm -hmm. If conservatives actually believed in family structure and supporting parents, they would today end that policy and I'm sure progressives would join them, but they don't. So I think as we go through these next few months, we should all recognize this is hollow rhetoric to ensure that it's someone else's problem, not a policy infrastructure that they're responsible for. And that's how we recognize that this is really just an excuse. Look, I, just very quickly, we want strong families. We want healthy families. Marriage is not a silver bullet to ending poverty. Uh, and you have all manners of family. Lots of married people are poor. <laughs> are, and, right, but different kinds of family structures as well. In addition to which, the nature, uh, watch what is happening in the country. If you take a look at the, uh, at, 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 at the trends, you're looking at a majority of, 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 of folks who are unmarried. Uh, and you're looking at women, women who are unmarried, that's single, widowed, divorced or separated. They are one of the largest demographic groups today. One of every uh, two women is pardon? One of every two women is unmarried. So that you, one has got to deal with what is going on. Uh, and so as I say, it's not a silver bullet. It's, as, as Nira pointed out, do we want structure? Do we want, yes. Uh, and, and, and there are, and the necessity to help families different than what we view as two parents, two kids, 
and, and probably still that the mother stays home and isn't working. That's where our, 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 sometimes our policy goes these days. Our public policy initiatives have not kept up with what is going on in, 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 in families today. Is that what we have to do is to make our public policy to mirror the way people are actually living today. And that we have not done, uh, and we want to blame people uh, for what a concept is of what it was in the past. That's let's That's move forward and let's, as, as, as this report has pointed out, deliberate choices that we need to make to turn this around. And it's up to us, those of us who serve, to deal with the kinds of public policy that help to make a difference in people's I lives. I can't think of a better ending for our program. We could and go I just on. Want to say this. We could go on for hours. I know. Look, thank you. Here thank you. Here. Here. I just want to say something. You know, if we're going to fix this, we got to come to the table, and certain normative assumptions can't be there. It, you know, I just want to repeat what I said when I first opened my mouth. If we come to the table, if they want to come to the table, talk about. People who are poor being broken. That's just a non-starter. We can't even start to talk about how to fix this. You know, if your notion is that you're going to stand up at a drug treatment program and start talking about how to help the poor. And what they want yeah, to do great is to point. cut off those benefits, of food stamp benefits, yeah. to someone who they want a drug test. Right. Yeah. That's exactly. a reality. Right. I listen to this every single day in the Ag Committee. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mind Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, it's always so great thank to be you. with such passive leaders. <laughs> and you're certainly not a passive leader.